Welcome again, everybody, to the Sunday Speaker at the uh, Humanist Society of Greater Phoenix. Um, remember, if you enjoy the content that you see here today, uh, like and subscribe our YouTube channel. It goes a great way to getting the message out there in front of more people. Um, <clears throat> and just showing our support for the community at large. You can also find us on Patreon, uh, the funds of which go towards our uh, AV system. Uh, and then again, always on hsgp.org. But the best way to interact with us is to become a member. If you haven't done so yet, head to hsgp.org and sign up. Uh, Roger would be happy to take your membership donation. Speaking today, uh, we have again, Bob McWhirter. <laughs> Bob is here on the day of the 155th anniversary of the 14th Amendment. Happy birthday. Uh, Bob has successfully tried over 100 criminal, uh, criminal trials, federal, state, and city courts. He is nationally and internationally known as a speaker and author on trial advocacy, immigration law, and the history of the Bill of Rights. Bob's a frequent guest. We even have his picture on the wall. Um, it's true. Uh, Bob's a certified specialist in criminal law, and for over six years, his peers have elected him to serve on the Arizona State Bar Board of Governors. Uh, since 2009, Mr. McWhorter has been named a Southwest Super Lawyer. He's international management experience, having worked and continuing to work extensively in Latin America on justice reform. Uh, he's a 2016 Distinguished Alumni Award recipient from the Barrett Honors College and a 2019 Distinguished Alumni Award recipient from Sandra Day O'Connor College of Law. Uh, Mr. McWhorter continues his private practice in criminal defense and testifies and provides expert advice on immigration consequences of criminal conviction and citizenship issues. So everybody, please give a big HSGP welcome to Bob McWhorter. Oh, you got it. We on here? All right. Well, good. Uh, today we have part two of what I spoke about, what, a couple weeks ago. Uh, it doesn't matter if you weren't here last time, the talk can stand on its own, but it does help to know the background uh, as well. Uh, this, of course, is Harry Tubman, uh, and as I've told you before, the author gave me permission to use uh, his mural on the cover of the book. I like it because of the image and what she's saying and helping people up out of slavery, and it also looks like she's saying, hey, buy this book, but anyway. <laughs> Uh, this is actually session four of a course. I think I told you that at the Barrett Honors College in the fall, I'll be giving the full five public lectures over the course of the fall and then having a seminar with students. Uh, defining a new nation. Uh, this is the Supreme Court versus the Gettysburg Address. Did they even bother to read the 14th Amendment? Uh, I would also say I would ask that the current Supreme Court do something about reading the current 14th Amendment as well. I will touch on that a little bit toward the end, but if you want to talk about it as we go, I do actually encourage questions, um, but you know, I'll go ahead and march through here, but as you know. Uh, I've also found that this group, it doesn't really matter if you encourage you not to ask questions or to ask <laughs> questions, you're just going to do what you're going to do anyway. Um, the Wait and Fuller courts uh, were by far, uh, in many ways, the worst Supreme Courts for this in the, in the history of the country. Um, I could maybe argue that the, the Roberts Court may be giving them a run for their money. Uh, the prior Supreme Courts dealt with a different constitution. Um, you can talk about Dred Scott, but you have to talk about it in the constitution that existed in 1857. The constitution that existed after 1870 and the three Civil War amendments being passed was a wholly different constitution. And these guys, for the most part, totally dropped the ball. And this is what led to most of the problems we had up until the 20th century through Jim Crow and everything else. It wasn't just the Civil War in the South, it's the law that came out of this court that totally misread the 14th Amendment and its purpose. There was no new birth of freedom for this court. 
Now, it wasn't until the Warren Court in the 1960s, and when I talk about the Dunning School, I, I talked about them last time, this, um, it was kind of a racist uh, group of academics from University of Columbia, Columbia University, who basically just kind of misread the entire Reconstruction era and the purpose of the statutes. Uh, United States versus Price, the Supreme Court finally cited historians for the obvious principle that the 14th Amendment protected freemen's rights. Seems pretty easy stuff, but it took until 1966 for the court to get it right in the Warren Court, which is why the Warren Court is one of the greatest courts that ever lived, if not the greatest. By the way, Price had to do with Mississippi burning. Remember the movie? Um, that was the case that came up, uh, emanated from that court. Um, three civil rights workers were killed, uh, Andrew Goodman, James Cheney, and Michael Schwerner. They were murdered. Their bodies were found 40 days later, and of course you had the loosely based movie with Hackman and William Defoe. Yeah. 14th Amendment. All persons born or naturalized in the United States or citizens are citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they reside. No state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor deny any person the equal protection of the laws. Good stuff. Good writing. It means the Bill of Rights directly applies to us. See, before the 14th Amendment, you never really talked about, oh, I want my First Amendment right to speak. You would talk about your state constitutional rights. It's the 14th Amendment that's the vehicle that allows for the America that we know and expect and this fabric of rights and, and obligations and privileges that we take for granted in a modern America. Now, what they failed to accept, the Wait and Fuller Courts, named after Chief Justice Wait and later Chief Justice Fuller, was that Congress had charted a new course for the nation. Section 5 reads, the Congress shall have the power to enforce by appropriate legislation the provisions of this article. That means that the Constitution now says that Congress is the one that can pass statutes to attend to social ills, to fight racism, to do all of these things. It's for Congress to do, and the Constitution says that now. Now, I've talked about original and before here. Congress will have the power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation. The 13th, 14th, 15th Amendments first put that language into the Constitution. It has subsequently been used by later amendments, such as the 19th Amendment. So what is original intent? Do we talk about the original intent of 1791 or, seven, or 1870? Well, 1870 is what matters. They superseded it. Okay, I hate to use this term. They trumped it. <laughs> Sorry. I mean, another thing, you kind of ruined a good verb. Okay, but leaving that aside. The framers in 1868 superseded the framers in 1791. Okay. And again, I've spoken of this before. You know, all the women in this room wouldn't have had the right to vote. They intended you not to have the vote. Persons of color didn't. Catholics didn't. All sorts of people did not have the right to vote in 1791. We don't follow their intent anymore because their intent doesn't matter. What matters is the intent of the writers of subsequent amendments. Congress shall have the power. It leaves no doubt that the framers meant to enforce it with full federal power, the Department of Justice, the federal courts, and the military, reshuffles the deck. The national government now has authority to intervene in local affairs to protect the basic rights of all Americans. It doesn't matter what some local state legislature wants to do anymore or what some local county sheriff wants to do. We have national values on these issues and those hold sway. Now, of course, the Wait and Fuller Courts did have one voice that consistently got all this right, and that was John Marshall Harlan. Now, the Wait and Fuller Courts relied on a pre-Civil War Constitution. In 1833, Chief Justice John Marshall in Barron versus Baltimore wrote, the Bill of Rights demanded security against the apprehended encroachments of the general government, not against those of local governments. And these amendments, the Bill of Rights, contain no expression indicating an intention to apply them to the state governments. Okay. This is why I titled this, did they even bother to read the 14th Amendment? 
which now says this doesn't matter. The 14th Amendment meant for the Bill of Rights to apply wholesale and for everybody in the universal concept of freedom, just like Abraham Lincoln said in the Gettysburg Address. There was good reason that the, to expect these courts should have done better. Uh, Abraham Lincoln was the first great court packer. I mean, you can't count George Washington. He packed them all because, you know, he started the whole thing. But leaving George Washington aside, the real great court packer was Abraham Lincoln. See, what happened was uh, Stephen Johnson Field, um, what they wanted to do, Lincoln and the Republican-controlled Congress, is create an anti-slavery majority to overturn Chief Justice Taney's Dred Scott decision. And he appointed four associate justices, one chief justice. Um, and then Lincoln, in 1863, got Congress to give him a tenth justice in order to pack the court. Now, remember when Kamala Harris said, not before 18, this 1864 election, you shouldn't appoint somebody, which, of course, you know, President Trump just ignored. Well, Kamala Harris wasn't exactly right on that. See, Lincoln didn't fill a seat this close to an election. Well, there was kind of a reason. See, Roger Taney died October 12, 1864. Uh, Congress wasn't in session until after the election, so he couldn't have appointed a, a justice anyway. And besides that, Lincoln was going to probably put Salmon Chase in as chief justice, which he subsequently did. Now, Chase was always a little bit tenuous in his cabinet, and he wanted to assure that Chase would be loyal to him. So don't run against me, and I'll appoint you to the Supreme Court. But I'm not going to do it until after the election. So Lincoln is really smart. I mean, he just does it right. So really, when Kamala Harris said Lincoln didn't do it, well, Lincoln really couldn't have anyway. And so that wasn't exactly correct. I mean, it made certain political hay, but I mean, it really wasn't exactly correct. Now, Andrew Johnson comes in, and Andrew Johnson, up until very recently, was widely considered the worst president in U.S. history. Um, and he had these, all these fights with Congress. Um, in 1866, he nominated Henry Stanbury to go to the Supreme Court. Well, what Congress did is they eliminated the seat. Now, you can't fire a Supreme Court justice after the Supreme Court justice is sitting. That's the Constitution. You can't lower their salary. You can't do much of anything. But you can eliminate a seat. Congress sets the number of justices. So rather than give Johnson a pick on the Supreme Court, they just got rid of the, the seat in, entirely. Uh, and then they lowered the number of justices to seven to make sure that you know, you'd have to have a lot of people die for Johnson ever to get a seat to appoint to the Supreme Court. Okay. Well, what happened is Grant gets elected president in 1869, and what did Congress do? They immediately gave him two justices back. They raised the number back to nine, so Grant got two of his ultimate four justices immediately upon taking office. Okay, so this was all engineered by the Congress. William Strong and Joseph Bradley, both of whom should have been better, and they weren't. So this brings us to the question of race in the Supreme Court. The first case that the Supreme Court gets dealing with the 14th Amendment are the slaughterhouse cases. Now, in this talk, it's much more driven by Supreme Court stuff. Um, so I you know, hope that it doesn't, you know, those of us who grew up reading this stuff is one thing. But I, I hope I patch it in a way so we can all see how this works and how the court kind of used these sleights of hand. Um, it's the first interpretation. It's a pivotal case in early rights law. Now, the question is, the Privileges and Immunity Clause, does it only protect the legal rights of federal citizenship and not state citizenship? That's the question. New Orleans was tired of animal guts floating down the Mississippi River. That's the start of this case, right? Um, upstream, there were these slaughter hostels, contaminated drinking water, causing cholera. It was just a mess, right? This stuff is called offal, okay? Offal, yeah, it's awful. By the way, you ever eat haggis? <laughs> so, you know, it's awful. Okay. So a thousand butchers gutted more than 300,000 animals per year and just sent the slough floating down the river, down to New Orleans. Okay. So New Orleans uh, passed a law allowing New Orleans to create a corporation to remove the slaughterhouses. The slaughterhouses, using the butchers' union, uh, challenged the constitutionally out of the corporation under the 14th Amendment. 
Um, it violated the right to sustain their labor, lives through labor. Okay, so what you have is the owners of the slaughterhouses using a union <laughs> in order to try to affect their economic interests is what's going on here. And they said, let's grab the 14th Amendment and try this. All right. The case facially has nothing to do with civil rights, but has everything to do with them. And what they're doing is they're going in and saying, hey, the federal government, we have federal rights under the 14th Amendment, so let's stop this state action. In a four to five decision by Justice Miller, the 14th Amendment does not restrict a state's police powers. And the 14th Amendment's first sentence, all persons are citizens of the United States in the state wherein they reside, creates two citizenships, U.S. and state. Okay. I've seen some heads shaking. I get the same thing. I mean, it ain't that complicated. The 14th Amendment said if you're a citizen of both. Oh, no, no, we're going to read this as two types of citizenship. The second sentence forbidding states from making any laws which shall abridge only applied to federal rights. Federal citizen rights in 1870 was the right to travel between states and use navigable waters. Yeah. <laughs> so what they're saying is this whole 14th Amendment just gives you federal rights. That's all it does. Now, if you remember two weeks ago, it was very clear the people wrote this. They wanted you to have a broad base and concept of rights all encompassed in the Bill of Rights and beyond. No, this is what it means to use navigable waters. By the way, Justice Kennedy, when he concurred in Dobbs, the case overturning Roe versus Wade, did write, as I see it, some other abortion-related legal questions raised by today's decision are not especially difficult as a constitutional matter. For example, may a state bar a resident from that state from traveling to another state to obtain an abortion? In my view, the answer is no, based on the constitutional right to interstate travel. So he's going back to Slaughterhouse and saying, yeah, you have the right to use navigable water to travel between states. That's a federal right. So even he recognizes that in the Dobbs decision, and that goes all the way back. The trouble, of course, is it's denying the broad expansion of rights that we've all come to expect and understand the Constitution really incorporates. According to Mill and the Court, okay, Constitution, Article 4, Section 2, Clause 1, the citizens of each state shall be entitled to all the privileges and immunities of, uh, of citizens in the several states is not the same in scope as the 14th Amendment. No state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of the citizens of the United States. The 14th Amendment Privilege and Immunity Clause speaks only of privileges and immunities to, of citizens of the United States and does not speak of those of citizens of the several states. This is just ludicrous on its face. I mean, you just got to read these things. You don't need a bunch of legal training to get this. Just read the stuff. Thus, the entire domain of the privileges and immunities of the states lay within the constitutional legislative power of the states, not the federal government. What about no, no state shall make or enforce any law, right? No state, this is what uh, Slaughterhouse Majority, ignores what Representative Bingham wrote and the people ratified, a broad protection of constitutional rights of citizens of the United States under national constitution. The 14th Amendment Privileges and Immunity Clause referred to the same privileges and immunities in the Constitution and meant to apply it broadly. No, we've just created two different ones, one of which only gives you the right to use navigable waters. The 14th Amendment's original intent was no state can favor one person or group under the law over another. Now, here's where you get this thing. Okay, citizens of each state. The scope guarantees every U.S. citizen gets all rights the U.S. Constitution provides. The scope, according to Slaughterhouse, is the guarantees of every U.S. state gets all the rights the U.S. Constitution provides. Okay, all the state's privileges and immunities apply to all Americans under the 14th Amendment. And again, I'm, I'm kind of belaboring a point here, but it just couldn't be clear at all. The 14th Amendment's authors, who of course are still active and alive at the time this case come down, do not denounce Slaughterhouse. Different levels of citizenship is inconsistent with America, an America conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal, to grab from the Gettysburg Address. 
Now, four justices dissenting, expressing thoughts very much like Lincoln. Liberty is freedom from all restraints. Beyond that line lies the domain of usurpation and tyranny. The equal protection of laws places all upon a footing of legal equality and gives the same protection to all for the preservation of life, liberty, and property and the pursuit of happiness. The 14th Amendment's novelty was known and measure and the measure deliberately adopted to enable the nation, the nation to secure to everyone within its jurisdiction the rights and privileges enumerated which all are entitled to enjoy. Without such authority, any government claiming to be national is glaringly defective. What he's saying is, yeah, look, they knew perfectly well that the Supreme Court, the Constitution before this, didn't allow for this expansion. That's why they wrote the 14th Amendment, to directly deal with that. To give the full scope to what the real vision of America was always meant to be. Slaughterhouse gutted the 14th Amendment privilege and music laws. Rather than the new birth of freedom, the court paved the road for states to override uh, national foundation of rights. In 1833, Barron versus Baltimore, the court upheld the Bill of Rights did not apply to the states. Slaughterhouse said the same thing. What would have been a point of the 14th Amendment? The next case that comes in is a case called United States versus Cruikshank. Now this case has gotten some play because it deals with Second Amendment issues. Um, held the First Amendment doesn't apply to the states and the Second Amendment doesn't apply to the states. Oddly enough, you have a lot of very gun-happy people who have denounced this case as well. I would kind of wish they would denounce the broader implications of the case because the case for, in part is still good law. But here's the way this goes. Uh, D.C. versus Heller, McDonald versus Chicago, individual right to bear arms applies to the states. That's been found by the court. The court needs to go broader than that and talk about all individual rights, not just the right to bear arms. Okay. And by the way, those of you who have friends who are big Second Amendment people, but maybe not all hip on the other scope of the 14th Amendment, you might want to point out to them that the only reason why you can talk about the Second Amendment right to bear arms is because of the 14th Amendment. And this broader concept of rights that the 14th Amendment also does, you got to take two. So all of these broader rights is what gives you the Second Amendment. Okay? And I think I said this last time. I mean, some of these folks will you know, tell you Jesus wrote the Constitution. <laughs> but, but to be fair, they don't really say that. What they say is Jesus wrote the Second Amendment and then he wrote the Constitution. Okay? <laughs> But the point is, it only comes because of this expanded notion of rights. Um, by the way, it's all about disarming black people. In 1872, the Louisiana gubernatorial election was hotly disputed between Reconstruction Republicans and racist Democrats claiming victory. A federal judge ruled that for the Republicans, but the Democrats didn't accept this. White Democrats armed with rifles and a small cannon overpowered Republican freedmen and a black state militia protecting the courthouse in uh, Colfax, Virginia. Most of the freedmen were killed after they surrendered. Estimates of dead ranged from 62 to 153 thrown in the river in unmarked graves. Now three whites were killed, <laughs> mostly from friendly fire. In other words, they didn't do a very good job. And then the marker says, erected to the memories of the heroes who fell in the Colfax riot fighting for white supremacy. Now, this leaves no question about what the purpose was it wasn't about fair elections or anything like that. They had had a fair election. It was about maintaining white supremacy. So any revisionist history has to deal with the fact that somebody put a marker up there saying exactly what the whole point was. I love this. This is a historical marker. Now, let's read this. Colfax riot. Okay, now, it's Colfax massacre is the more correct description of what occurred. On this site occurred the Colfax riot. Passive voice construction by, okay, occurred, passive voice, in which three white men and 150 Negroes were slain. The event on April 13, 1873 marked the end of carpetbagger misrule in the South. This is just an absurd distortion of history. I'm, bet you, I'm betting the daughters of the American Revolution put this up, or daughters of the Confederacy put this up, okay? Um, but this is just totally trying to whitewash things, right? Um, were slain is a passive voice construction. Mark the end is active voice construction. 
trying to emphasize one thing with verbiage and not the other. Several of the white insurgents convicted under the, were convicted under the 1870 Enforcement Act for hindering the freedmen's First Amendment right to assemble and Second Amendment right to bear arms. The convictions were appealed to the United States Supreme Court. Justice Waite is there now, and the, he rules the 14th Amendment due process and equal protection clauses apply only to state action, not individual action. Okay, now here's another little sleight of hand going on. Because now we're saying, oh, these people were just individuals. We can only use these amendments to apply to state action. The Second Amendment only restricts the national government. This is not a right guaranteed by the Constitution. Neither is it in any manner dependent upon that internment for its existence. Now this is, has been overturned by the gun rights people with the Heller decision and with McDonald. But this is the tenor of the court. Thus, states can restrict the right, is the point. The court again relied on Barron versus Baltimore from 1833 that the Bill of Rights did not apply to the states. Thus, the massacre of a political gathering at Colfax implicated neither the First Amendment nor Second Amendment uh, because it was for a state, not a federal election. Another sleight of hand. The First Amendment was not intended to limit the powers of the state governments in respect to their own citizens, but to operate upon the national government alone. Thus, for their protection and its enjoyment, the people must look to the states. The power for that purpose was originally placed there, and it has never been surrendered to the United States. Well, never surrendered? What about Appomattox? What about the Civil Rights legislation, the Freemans Bureau, Reconstruction, all passed over Andrew Johnson's vetoes, first vetoes overrides ever in American history. What about Section 5? Congress shall have the power to enforce by appropriate legislation the provisions of this article. Of course it was surrendered. Now look, we live in a federalist governmental structure. State power actually has a lot of power over the regulation of our lives. You want to drive your car. It's not the federal government that tells you you get a driver's license. It's state government. Okay, all of this accrues. Okay, so that has not changed. That is correct. But when you're talking about the subject of a subsequent amendment to the Constitution, which clearly says states applies to the states as well, it does change our life, and the federal government is involved in that issue. So if you look at all the regulation of our lives, there's still a federal system going on here. It's just on issues of race and justice and equity. We look to a broader value system, and our concepts, our very concepts of rights, the Bill of Rights, First Amendment, whatever, we look to the federal values and federal government on this. What about the 14th Amendment intent? I prepared the first section of the 14th Amendment as it stands in the Constitution to meet Marshall's objection that the existing amendments are not applicable to and do not abide the states. John Bingham, he's the one who wrote the 14th Amendment first section. Benjamin Butler of Massachusetts, if the federal government cannot pass laws to protect the rights, liberty, and lives of the citizens of the United States and the states, why were guarantees of those fundamental rights put in the Constitution at all? The 14th Amendment, no state shall, meant for the Bill of Rights apply to apply to the states. We've eventually come around to this through kind of an incorporation doctrine, doc, doctrine but not really as fully as it should be, based on the intent of the framers of the Constitution. Now, this is where you get into this question of originalism. Uh, a lot of conservative jurists will call themselves originalists, but they don't want to understand the original intent of the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. They are very selective. But if you read what these people intended, and if you implemented it at the time, we could have ended, or at least start to treat, 100 years earlier and avoided a great deal of pain and suffering on the way. For the Reconstruction Republicans, the Bill of Rights defined the 14th Amendment privileges and immunities. Senator Jacob Howard introduced the 14th Amendment. The first eight amendments do not op did, did not operate in the slightest degree as a restraint or prohibition upon state legislation. States are not affected by them, but the 14th Amendment meant to change this. The great object of the first section of this amendment is, therefore, to restrain the power of the states and compel them at all times to respect the great fundamental guarantees. So when Thomas Jefferson writes 
we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal in the Declaration of Independence. Yeah, there's no more little asterisks that say, yeah, except for the folks I own. It just wipes it away. And that was the point. That's why we fought a civil war. That's why we changed the Constitution. This is what this court did not grasp, and I really don't think the current course fully grasps. There was no new birth of freedom the day the court handed down Krushank. The court cleared the way for the violent restoration of white supremacy and segregation unchecked for a century. And if there's any doubt about what the intent of these folks were, just read that grave marker. The heroes dying for white supremacy. Now this brings us then to 1883, the civil rights cases. It held that the 1875 Civil Rights Act was unconstitutional. Now, the Civil Rights Act had banned race discrimination and access to public services, something we take for granted, but it had to be fought for 100 years later. But the court held that Congress lacked authority to regulate private affairs under the 14th Amendment, and the 13th Amendment merely abolishes slavery. Okay, what about Section 5? Congress will have the power. Okay, again. Now, the civil rights cases... Justice Harlan famously dissented. Justice Bradley, remember one of the appointees from uh, uh, Ulysses S. Grant, who was the great first civil rights president, he writes, it would be running the slavery argument into the ground to make every act of discrimination which a person may see fit to make as to the guests he will entertain or as to the people he will take into his coach or cab or car or to admit to his concert or theater or to deal with other matters of intercourse or business. Now, Bradley had earlier written a memo to uh, Justice William Woods about the Civil Rights Act, kind of belying his myopic view on race. It never can be endured that the white shall be compelled to lodge and eat and sit with the Negro. The antipathy of race cannot be crushed and annihilated by legal enactment. Does freedom of the blacks require slavery of the whites? Enforced fellowship would do that. Well, enforced fellowship wasn't the issue. What was the issue was everybody should have a right to free access to goods and services in society that are publicly presented in the course of a capitalist system, trading trading money for services and work for money. Nobody disagreed with Bradley that choosing the guests one entertains was a social, not a civil right. Okay, so no guess who's coming to dinner, right? Okay. Just that Bradley would have been nuts about this, right? Uh, Loving versus Virginia, just 85 years later, would have caused Bradley's head to spin. By the way, let me do that again. Yeah, got him to spin. Okay, spin. Oops, no, it didn't spin. There we go. So Bradley and the court missed the point. For a new birth of freedom, society must not deny anyone access to basic goods and public accommodations. This includes access to a cab or concert or theater or deal with other matters of intercourse or business. Let me just be kind of simple about this. Let's say you're heading for a job. How are you going to have a fair chance at a job if you can't make the interview because you can't catch a cab? It's more than just denying a black person access to a lunch counter or a hotel room. These are essential rights of free labor and equality in competition for advancement in the economic marketplace. The court created this state versus private discrimination distinction. Anything privately owned, the 14th Amendment didn't apply. Well, this is just absurd. Even privately owned accommodations are still public. All businesses benefit from streets, police, fire protection, and other government services everyone's taxes pay. That includes black people, gay people, etc. If you don't want to sell a cake to a gay couple for their marriage, first I kind of think, okay, you want to cut yourself out of the you know, greatest expanding marriage market you know, it ever hit. That's kind of your choice. But the point is you can't do that and offer it as a public service to, to other people. Because your cake shop benefits from an entire regulatory scheme that everybody's taxes pay for. Or a web design, design, somebody said. (laughs) 
Uh, by the way, I, I, um, that case has a particular, <laughs> there wasn't even a case in controversy. Yeah, you're not supposed to do that. No. <laughs> the, the brilliance of the common law is you have statutes and application and law and, and the courts apply it to unique cir circumstances they see. They don't give advisory opinions. It's advisory opinion, okay? Have your cake and eat it too. Okay, it's not about the cakes. We all know that, okay? This is this artistic expression issue. Oberfeld, 14th Amendment due process equal protection clause is guaranteed a fundamental right to marry. And by the way, this artistic expression thing, my attitude is if I can do it, it's probably not great art, yeah. okay? <laughs> now I could give you maybe the second cake has some artistic expression value to it, okay, right, whatever. But if you're offering it for sale to the public, you gotta offer it to everybody for free. Yeah. The, the, the way I saw it was we have a right to participate in the economy of the United States. Mm -hmm. If you have the right to your political opinion, but you don't have the right to have a television show, right? Yeah. Okay. So you have the right to have a, a web design or a cake or a bakery. But you don't, you have don't have a right, right to tell. Yeah, just tell Tucker Carlson. He doesn't have a right to a television show. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But you, you, you have the, the right to buy a cake or the, mm -hmm. you know, the right to have a web design for you, but you don't have the right to have a business that provides those services. So yeah. if it's open to the public, it's open to the, the public. public. Well, let's kind of give an example of the nuance of this. Okay, I want my rainbow cake for my, for my event, my same-sex event or whatever, right? You could say, hey, I'm sorry, we don't do rainbow cakes. We just don't do those here. And you can't be forced to do it. But then you can't go and sell one to little Susie who's having her fifth grade birthday party and wants a rainbow cake. We well, can't say, okay, I'll make it for Susie now. Okay, so you can say, I don't offer rainbow cakes. Okay, fine. But you can't then discriminate beyond that. Across the state line. Now we're talking about interstate commerce. Oh, inter well, yeah, that's, yeah, okay. That's a whole different constitutional issue, but okay. <laughs> so, Justice Markle, Marshall, again, dissents. A man, now, he's an interesting guy. He's, he's from a slaveholding family. Right. He calls out the court's hypocrisy, ignoring the amendments. He fought for the Union during the Civil War. Uh, and he gets ridiculed at the time, but he becomes the clarion for rights in the next century. Harlan agreed government has nothing to do with social rights of individuals, and if one citizen chooses not to hold social intercourse with another, he is not and cannot be made amenable to the law for his conduct in that regard. And let's just be very clear. The United States Constitution lets you be as racist as you want to be. There's no constitutional issue. Now, of course, if you show up to a, you know, a, a white rally or something like that, and then you get videotaped, and then you go to work on Monday, and your employer fires you, as long as that employer is not the federal government or a state government, too bad for you, because they have the right to fire you. Okay, but nothing says the Constitution says you, you don't have a right to be racist. You can believe whatever the hell you want, right? So we can, that's not even the debate here. But the 13th Amendment did something more than prohibit slavery as an institution. It established and decreed universal civil freedom throughout the United States. The 1875 Civil Rights Act secured legal, not social rights. By the way, the Supreme Court has yet to give full scope to Got this? Yeah, to give, I've got a little bit of feedback going on this. To give full scope to the 13th Amendment, we always talk about the 14th Amendment, but the right of a black person to access public accommodations was no more a social right than their right to sit in a public building with others of whatever race for the purpose of hearing the public questions of the day discussed. The majority sacrificed the substance and spirit of the recent amendments. How this guy gets it right and the rest don't is just beyond me. What was the vote? Was it like you know, five, four? Uh, five, four. Uh, I forget. I'd, I'd have to go back. Yeah. Uh, the men who wrote the 14th Amendment intended to rectify the mistake of Dred Scott and other pre civil rights, civil war cases supporting slavery. They intended to do for human liberty and the fundamental rights of American citizenship what it did with the sanction of the court for the protection of slavery. Remember all that crappy stuff with Dred Scott? We wanted to write the 14th Amendment so the court would do the exact opposite of Dred Scott. Nearly 100 years passed before the Supreme Court, less fettered by racism, came to this obvious conclusion. Bradley did recognize the right to enjoy equal accommodations and privileges in all ends, public conveyances and places of public amusement is one of the essential rights of citizenship. But the 1875 Civil Rights Act exceeded what the 14th Amendment allowed. They went out of their way to find that the 1875 Civil Rights Act was unconstitutional. Um, they had to work to do it. Now, 
there's a question in all this, now this is going to be kind of legally legally stuff, of appropriate judicial review. What should have been the Supreme Court's deference to Congress? Now, if you all remember Marbury versus Madison, 1803, it, it established what was clearly intended in the Constitution, the right of courts to review acts of Congress to make sure they're constitutional, also acts of states, right? Validate legislative and executive actions, holding something unconstitutional. Judicial review is not explicit in the Constitution, but clearly intended, right? Now, Congress passes statutes under various parts of the Constitution. Okay, for instance, much of the New De Deal was passed under the Commerce Clause. You know, where did your wheat come from to bake that cake? The Supreme Court regularly reviews these for constitutionality. Okay, that's what they are. But the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments put a new clause, which is Congress shall have the power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation. People ratify these amendments as the Constitution in Article 5 allows and requires, prescribes. Oops, okay, fix that. Where's Diane when I need her? After the Taney Court's failure on slavery, Congress, not and the nation that elected it, and the nation that ratified the 13th, 14th, 15th Amendments, Congress, not the court, was intended to be the first guardians of civil rights. The court was supposed to follow Congress. The Supreme Court should have been far more deferential to any act of Congress under the 14th Amendment than it is to other acts of Congress passed under other parts of the Constitution. The Commerce Clause has no provision or section that says Congress shall have the power to enforce this by appropriate legislation. The 14th Amendment does. The court should have deferred and should still defer to congressional actions on this. The same as the 15th Amendment, anything under the 13th Amendment. And yet the court gives no extra deference to any of these statutes at all, despite the fact the Constitution says it should. The justice and the majority fully wanted to end slavery. These guys were anti-slavery. There's no question about that. But that doesn't mean they weren't racist. Several fought to end it during the Civil War, but they could not comprehend, much less accept, the idea of a black person as a social equal. That's what I think tripped them up on these courts. The civil rights cases laid the foundation of American apartheid, which Plessy versus Ferguson expanded a decade later. The Fuller Court, after gutting the privilege and the immunities and the due process clauses, what about using the Equal Protection Clause? See, there's a lot of people fighting to get these cases heard in the Supreme Court to expand this, to say, look, give these amendments the scope they intend. Well, this brings in Plessy versus Ferguson. 1896, upheld the constitutionality of racial segregation laws for public facilities under separate but equal fiction. Justice Harlan, again, famously dissented. Now, the 14th Amendment purpose was a broad protection against racial discrimination in public accommodations. Slaughterhouse and the civil rights cases eliminated the 14th Amendment's privileges and immunities clause. Proponents of racial justice tried another source, and that is the Equal Protection Clause. So, what do you think is the easiest way to defeat an Equal Protection Clause argument? Segregation. How about, say it's separate but equal? In other words, it's glib, it's superficial, but it's just, okay, we just eliminated the whole argument that way. Separate but equal. It denies all social reality, it denies racial prejudice, it denies the terrible effect that apartheid has, but it gets rid of the argument in a glib, superficial, terrible way. The answer is separate but equal. 1883, the civil rights cases held that Congress could do nothing against private discrimination. Thirteen years later, Plessy versus, uh, versus Ferguson took a step, the, the civil rights cases a step further. What they said is, approved government-mandated racial segregation in public facilities, even when the private owners did not wish it, could be affected. This has taken the law even further than before. Right, even in private. And what happens? The East Louisiana Railroad Company didn't want racial segregation. Plessy versus Ferguson was an orchestrated case, uh, test case, of the Louisiana's 1890 Separate Car Act. I'd like to think the executives at the East Louisiana um, Railroad Company had some progressive ideas and believed in racial equality. 
On the other hand, what would be the other reason? They don't want to make two cars for everything. <laughs> they don't want to have separate facilities. It's not economically viable, which is why <laughs> racial, why, why American apartheid and segregation was never economically viable. Okay, but I'd like to think that maybe they had good motives in, as well. In other words, they were racially just. Okay. Uh, now, on June 7, 1892, Homer Plessy bought a first-class rail ticket from the East Louisiana Railroad Company for the whites-only car. Now. Plessy could have passed. It was Passe Blanc in Louisiana. Uh, he was an octoroon, which meaning only one-eighth black ancestor. So if you would have seen him, you would have thought this was a white guy, right? They chose him for that reason, or he chose himself and volunteered for that reason, because you start to show the absurdity of these things. That was the point. Now, even having one drop black blood, octoroon, meant that you had to sit in the, quote, colored car. Now, the railroad arranged for a private investigator to peacefully arrest him on the specific charge of violating the Separate Car Act rather than on trespassing or something like that. So they just orchestrated this whole thing to get the case up to the Supreme Court. The court upheld the Separate Car Act because the 13th Amendment just eliminated slavery, and the 14th Amendment civil rights do not include the social right to sit next to white people. Utterly absurd. The 14th Amendment did not abolish distinctions based upon color or to enforce social as distinguished from political equality or a commingling of the two races upon terms unsatisfactory to either. In the court's fictional world, everything was separate but equal. Thus, the 14th Amendment Equal Protection Clause did not apply. Black people could expect nothing more from the Constitution. No problem for black people to declare Justice Brown because it was fallacy for black people to assume that the enforced separation of the two races stamps the colored race with the badge of inferiority. Yeah. If this be so, it is because the colored race chooses to put that construction upon it. So, not only did black people suffer second class citizenship and inferior services, even though they paid the same fares, bills, and taxes, any problem with it was only in their own mind. Is this naive or disingenuous? I think it's utterly disingenuous. Some people argue it was naive. White people believed black people were inferior and wanted to be separate because they were not equal. That was the whole point. Brown and the court created the perfect formula to defeat any equal protection clause claim. Separate but equal is glib as it is dishonest. Now, the court, in fact, ignored the privacy rights of the owners of the railroad or any private owner. Justice Bradley put it in the civil rights cases, law should not dictate as to the people he will take into his coach um, or cab or car. In other words, if you want to take persons of color into your coach, cab, or car, you should be allowed to do it. No, not after Plessy. This is where the court has extended this even to the realm of absurdity. The East Louisiana Louis and a railroad company opposed the separate car act and supported his cause, Plessy's cause. If the court would have been consistent with Bradley's opinion 13 years earlier, it would have found the Separate Car Act unconstitutional for preventing a private company from serving black people if it chose to do so. Harlan, again, the lone prophetic dissenter. Louisiana's Separate Car Act should not stand because the arbitrary separation of citizens on race is wholly inconsistent with the civil freedom and the equality before the law established by the Constitution. It cannot be justified on, upon any legal grounds. The white race deems itself to be dominant race in this country, and so it is in prestige and achievements in education, wealth, and in power. So I no doubt it will continue to be before all time if it remains true to its great heritage and hold fast to the principles of constitutional liberty. I think it's important here to realize that when he says the white race is dominant, it's not asserting genetic inferiority, it's asserting a value system of, of rights and liberties that if we stay true to, then that will do it. Rather than social constructs of prestige, achievement, education, wealth, and power provide this advantage, only holding fast to constitutional liberty can America claim its heritage, and Louisiana betrayed the heritage. But in the view of the Constitution, in the eye of the law, there is in this country no separate dominant ruling class of citizens. There is no caste here. Our Constitution is colorblind and neither knows nor tolerates classes among citizens. Today, most people quote Plessy for Harlan's dissent. In respect of civil rights, all citizens are equal before the law. The humblest is the peer of the most powerful. 
The law regards man as man and takes no account of his surroundings or his color when his civil rights is guaranteed by the supreme law of the land are involved. And by the way, let's go back to Abraham Lincoln in 1858, before the Civil War. Lincoln would have lamented Plessy. In 1858, Lincoln argued, uh, urged America to unite as one people throughout this land. During the war, Lincoln ordered the South Carolina tax commissioners to apply taxes equally to the education of colored youths and of such poor white persons as you in your judgment shall deem most eligible. Separate is not and never has been equal, as has been clear from history. In 1789, when James Madison introduced the Bill of Rights to Congress, he defined the role of federal courts as independent tribunals of justice that will consider themselves in a peculiar manner the guardians of those rights. The court was to be an impenetrable bulwark against every assumption of power in the legislative, legislative or executive that would violate an individual's rights because they will naturally be led to resist every encroachment upon rights expressly stipulated for in the Constitution by the Declaration of Rights. The Supreme Court should have been that impenetrable bulwark. The law regards man as man and takes no account of his surroundings or his color when his civil rights, as guaranteed by the Supreme Law of Land, are involved. It is therefore to be regretted that this high tribunal, the final expositor of the fundamental law of the land, has reached the conclusion that it is competent for a state to regulate the enjoyment of citizens of their civil rights solely on the basis of race. In my opinion, the judgment this day rendered will in time prove to be quite as pernicious as the decision made by this tribunal in, Dred, in the Dred Scott case. He was right. There's an argument that Dred Scott, uh, leaving aside Taney's ugly gratuitous dicta regarding black people, was correctly decided under the Constitution of 1857. I don't particularly believe that argument, but there's an argument about it. How could the court then continue to read the Constitution the same after the Civil War and amendments with the Slaughterhouse, Cruikshank, Civil Rights case, and Plessy versus Ferguson? The court eliminated the 14th Amendment's authority to protect civil rights. And the problem started with judges. 27 Confederate veterans became federal judges after the Civil War. Four Supreme Court justices had been Confederate veterans. These men decided cases regarding the Klan and Jim Crow. Confederate veteran Edward White was in the majority in Plessy versus Ferguson. So being a traitor to the country didn't get you excluded from being on the U.S. Supreme Court. After Reconstruction, giving the South judgeships proved a kind of a reconciliation me measure. It gave the South power in the most undemocratic, non-democratic branch of government to protect a racist power structure. The mid-20th century civil rights movement, Georgia Lieutenant Governor and staunch segregationist Andrus Vandiver expressed satisfaction that our judges are steeped in the same traditions that I am, thank God, we have good federal judges. Part of the complication is uh, <laughs> Vandiver actually was behind the scenes really good in terms of implementing racial justice and desegregation. In public, however, this is the kind of thing he says. While being a traitor did not stop a lawyer from becoming a Supreme Court Justice, being a black man did. Among the first black men to serve in the 41st and 42nd Congresses were two lawyers, Josiah Wells and Robert B. Elliott. Elliott, as you recall when I spoke two weeks ago, was the one who so effectively argued for the 1875 Civil Rights Act bill to pass. No capable black man received a Supreme Court nomination until Thurgood Marshall. So how do we confront the fraud legal legacy? Well, this is where you get the Legal Defense Fund. Walter Francis White led the NAACP from 31 to 1955. He oversaw plans to organize the organizational structure to fight against public segregation. He authored uh, President Truman's uh, desegregation order of the troops in 1947. Black self-determination affected change. This is Charles Hamilton Houston, was a Phi Beta Kappa graduate of Amherst College, the first African-American editor of the Harvard Law Review. He got an advanced degree from Harvard, studied abroad, and returned to his father's thriving Washington, D.C. legal practice. He left a lucrative law practice to become a law professor, then dean of the Harvard law, Howard Law School, and to lead the Legal Defense Fund. Houston and later Thurgood Marshall led the Legal Defense Fund, teams of black and white lawyers for racial justice, Incrementalism 
was the key. How to count men, white, brown, and black. Seven years before Brown, Westminster versus Mendez came down, Ninth Circuit case. And the question was, <laughs> well, if you got black people and white people segregated, well, what do you do with brown people? Do you count them as black people or do you count them as white people? The third, okay. But the point is, they brought this case to show the absurdity of racial segregation. We have three-way segregation in Arizona. Okay. Yeah. Oh, that, yeah. okay. So what happens here? Thurgood Marshall, Robert Carter, Leo Miller for the National Association of Advancement of Colored People wrote Amicus Curiae, and what happened was this goes. There's a postage stamp still about it. Um, in Mendez versus Westminster, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals held it unconstitutional the forced segregation of Mexican-American students. The paramount requisite in the American system of public education is social equality and must be open to all children by unified school association regardless of lineage. This is starting to lay a foundation for seven years later, Brown versus Board. This is all a broad strategy done by the Legal Defense Fund. This is one of my favorites, what happens. George McLaurin held a master's degree from the University of Kansas and was a retired professor. He decides to um, go to the University of Oklahoma as a graduate student, and they admitted him, um, and then this becomes a legal defense fund. They win the case. Of course, he submits his application. They didn't know he was black. So they had to create a whole system just for him at the graduate level. First, they created an alcove, and these, these people created an entire different law school just for one guy. Now, this was all designed because states could not bear the incredible expense of creating a whole different law school. But if you're going to say separate but equal, the state's got to cough up the money for a separate law school, which is utterly absurd. So what happens? Although the university had to admit McLaurin, it segregated him from other students. He attended classes from an alcohol labeled reserved for colored. In a series of cases, the court ruled his treatments must be equal with white students, imposing the huge expense of maintaining a separate but equal facade. Fred Vinson wrote for the court, McLaurin was handicapped in his pursuit of effective graduate instruction. Such restrictions impair and inhibit his ability to study, to engage in discussion, and exchange views with other students, and in general, to learn his profession. Again, this is a precursor to Brown versus Board, laying the foundation here. The disparity in resources is quantifiable. Because in graduate school, you can look at the budget spent to maintain the school, and we have to have the exact same budget spent to maintain this whole other school. <laughs> they won against the segregated graduate education. Now, Chief Justice Fred Vinson led a divided court when Brown versus Board of Education came up in 1953. Despite his good opinion to McLaurin four years earlier, Vincent stated he would affirm the separate but equal. He did a great service to the country at this point and died <laughs> April 8th in 1953, bringing in Earl Warren. Now, he was the new justice came to the court. Um, he's a justice who believed in the new birth of freedom. He cut this deal with Eisenhower that he would stop, drop out of, he was a Republican, drop out of the presidential race if Eisenhower gave him the next Supreme Court position. It turned out that Vincent died as Chief Justice, so Eisenhower honored the deal and made him Chief Justice, even though that wasn't the original deal, but that was the first seat that opened up, which is why we have the Warren Court. Overturning, unanimously overturning Plessy, an achievement for any chief, but he, this is one he did in his first year which is remarkable because it was divided court under Vincent. May 17, 1955, Chief Justice Warren read Brown to a packed court. Now, by the way, he had cajoled his, he even visited one of his brethren in the hospital to get him to get a unanimous opinion. Comes in the question presented, said the chief. They read this opinion out loud. Does segregation in public schools solely on the basis of race, even though the physical facilities and other tangible factors may be equal, deprive the children of the minority group of equal educational opportunities. What is he saying here? Okay, we'll give you that it's, it's equal. Let's say it's just, just for argument's sake, it's equal. We all know it's not. But let's say it's equal. Does that still deprive people of the right to free education, the right to opportunities? 
We believe that it does. Okay. In that moment, America changed for the better. The plaintiffs are, by segregation, deprived of the equal protection of the laws guaranteed by the 14th Amendment. By segregation alone, forget the fact that the facilities are all unequal, segregation alone is the problem. We conclude that in the field of public education, the doctrine of separate but equal has no place. Separate but ed uh, ed educational facilities are inherently unequal. Brown was a constitutional sea change from an all-white court. Its foundation was the brilliant legal strategy of the LDF dismantling separate but equal by showing that separate could never mean equal. But the work followed the brilliant work of countless other lawyers, black and white, and thousands of suits for freedom. Dred Scott and Plessy lost in their day, but they did not give up. And that's what the Legal Defense Fund was really the heirs to, was that tenacity, that incrementalism, and not giving up. The whole decision was decried. Um, it didn't solve everything. The 19 senators and 77 congressmen signed the Southern Manifesto, defending segregation and condemning Brown's clear abuse of power. I thought the Southern Manifesto was kind of interesting, kind of like the Communist Manifesto, but these are anti-communists, right? So they signed the Southern Manifesto. White Citizens Council claimed the Constitution and the 10th Amendment protected states' rights and white rule. I have a whole other talk on states' rights. There is no such thing. Segregation argued the 14th Amendment had not been ratified. <laughs> Georgia adopted a resolution urging Congress to declare void the 14th and 15th Amendments. <laughs> like Congress, I just, just so you know, basic Congress can't void a part of the Constitution or an amendment. You've got to have go back for the amendment, okay? There has been an amendment that has been voided later on, right? 18th, 18th Amendment was voided by the 21st Amendment, okay? So you can do it that way if you want to, but you've got to do it that way. Okay, I've told you this before, right? You know how you remember 18th and 21st Amendments? 18th Amendment is prohibition, 21st Amendment. What's the drinking age in some states? 18. What's it in other states? 21. There you go. You will always look smart at a cocktail party now. <laughs> Calls for Warren's impeachment became perennial. Okay, race is mi mixing is communism. I am not really sure how race mixing is communism. You may not like race mixing. You don't get to go to market, right, yeah, markers. <laughs> you know, okay, so you don't want to do guess who's coming to dinner, okay? <laughs> None of that, you know, right? You don't get to marry Sidney Portier, fine, whatever. But I don't see how that's communist. But leaving that aside, it's communism, right? Um, yeah, calls. Okay, but look, America would not go back. And despite even what's going on in the court now, America would not go back. This talk that I'm giving now, 50 years ago would have been received differently, even by a progressive group like this. I mean, America's attitudes have changed greatly. That doesn't mean we don't have problems and stuff to do, but there's attitudes that are changed. You just don't have people openly, even despite some try, talk about white supremacy as if it's an it's accepted idea. Okay, don't make markers. There's coder language all over the place, but at least you don't have that. When Earl Warren became the court's 14th Chief Justice, Jim Crow ruled the South. States disenfranchised blacks with impunity. The Bill of Rights did not generally apply against the states. The court never used the First Amendment to invalidate congressional actions. Some states chilled core political expression. State organized prayers were common in public schools. State criminal defendants had few constitutional rights. No general right to vote existed. Almost all state legislatures were malapportioned. <laughs> Weekend at Bernie's, just bring it back. Um, over the next 16 years, all this changed, cementing the Warren Court's enduring influence and creating a new birth of freedom. I have maintained that despite what the current court wants to do and the courts that have happened, we're still living in the world that Earl Warren created, fundamentally. That has not changed. My most of a huge chunk of my career has been in public defense. That was all because of Gideon versus Wainwright. Okay, that has not changed. What did that do? What's that? Gideon versus uh, Guaranteed right to counsel in all criminal cases. Thank you. But yeah, sorry about that. Uh, sorry, sometimes I speak to lawyers and I don't know. So, so. Sorry about that. Loving versus Virginia ended all bans on interracial inter marriage. Nobody talks about that anymore. I mean, really? There should, there should, we should have a law preventing blacks and whites from marrying each other? Are you kidding me? Um, 
And I said, you know, the, the, the bears, the same-sex marriage case, all this gnashing of teeth, it's terrible, it's Armageddon, it's bad, bad, bad. Two weeks later, nobody talks about it anymore. Nobody cares. In criminal procedure, Gideon versus Wainwright required defendants to get lawyers. Miranda versus Arizona required the famous Miranda warnings. All were revolutionary in creating a more just America, and all of them really had underlying racial implications to them, which is what motivated the courts. Yeah, a lot of you I know. <laughs> but the Warren Court left much to do. Aside from Brown directly overruling Plessy, the court has not directly overruled Slaughterhouse, Cruikshank, or the civil rights cases. The court continues this state-private action dichotomy, sometimes called de facto versus de jure discrimination, that Slaughterhouse, Cruikshank, and the civil rights created. Rather than overturn the Wade and Fuller court cases, the court rejuvenated the old doctrine of substantive due process and the incorporation doctrine. We selectively incorporate parts of the Bill of Rights. Well, the whole thing should have gone in. Now, here's the curious case of Justice Thomas. <laughs> Ardent foe of affirmative action's constitutionality. McDonald versus Chicago, Second Amendment incorporated to the states of the Due Process Clause. He remains the only justice to call for reversing the Wade and Fuller court cases. Cruikshank is not a precedent entitled to any respect, would reach the same result by reversing the Slaughterhouse cases. Now, Alito, for the majority, said, though legal scholars consider Slaughterhouse wrong, they decided they declined to disturb the ruling. So this is what you do. What do you do with Clarence Thomas? Now, I don't know what the hell was going on with him. Maybe he just liked guns and it was a gun case, so he put it in. He maybe had a smart law clerk that year. I don't know. But the fact is, he does remain the only justice to have called for reversing these cases, which most legal scholars said clearly should be reversed. In a judicial system based on precedent, these post-Reconstruction decisions live on no matter how racist or faulty their historical foundation. Generally, the United States Supreme Court is not champion Lincoln's new birth of freedom, but instead is the primary defender of white privilege and racial inequality. In addition to Slaughterhouse and Civil Rights and Plessy, We've allowed racist internment of Japanese Americans, prevented redress for structural inequality, allowed resegregation of public education, and striking down protective provisions of the Voting Rights Act. The modern court's 14th Amendment equal protection cases primarily support white plaintiffs claiming reverse discrimination from affirmative action, as we know, which brings us to the recent case a few days ago of Students for Fair Admissions, Inc. versus the fellows of Harvard College and North Carolina, right? Held Harvard's and UNC's admissions uh, action program violate 14th Amendment Equal Protection Clause. Robert's opinion. Eliminating racial discrimination means eliminating all of it, and Equal Protection Clause we have accordingly held applies without regard to any difference, differences of race, of color, or of nationality. It is universal in its application. The guarantee of equal protection cannot mean one thing when applied to one individual and something else when applied to another person of another color. If both are not accorded the same protection, it is not equal. This is rending the entire thing out of his, its, its historical context and totally denying the social reality of today. Both of these signs are racially discriminatory. Okay, No dogs, Negroes, Mexicans, and I love black people. Now, when you think about it, they're both discriminating on the basis of race. But what the court has said is, according to the Supreme Court, neither is legally subject to remedy. Well, that's just wrong. That's not what the framers of the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments intended. Eliminating racial discrimination means eliminating all of it, according to Roberts. Now, I would really recommend um, Jackson Brown's uh, excuse me, Kenja Brown Jackson's uh, dissent, Sotomayor as well, who gets the history right. Uh, I think I've told you I sent my book to Justice Jackson's chambers. I got a nice note from, I think, her assistant to her assistant saying, thank you for sending the book. But I don't know, maybe some law clerk will grab it someday. Um, but, uh, but really, that's just clearly wrong. And using this language from Justice Harlan about colorblind constitution is out of context. Remedial measures were the intent of the 14th Amendment to create a colorblind constitution, a colorblind nation. Plessy versus Ferguson, this legacy 
is still with us today and needs to be redressed for the benefit of all of us. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. All men are created equal, going right back to the Declaration of Independence. That we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom. This defined the war's higher purpose. And the government of the people, by the people, for the people should not perish from the earth. That's the point. That was the point of affirmative action. You may not have liked it as a policy, but there was nothing unconstitutional about it. The people who followed Lincoln sent troops down to the South to enforce racial equality. This ties into we the people, the foundation. You need racial equality to have a functioning democracy. Without it, it's a farce. Will the Supreme Court ever fulfill the vision of the Gettysburg Address? It isn't doing it now, um, but my hope is it will. I have great faith in Justice Jackson and the potential for her to lead the court as its composition changes. So, I hate to say this, but you need a couple of white guys to just kind of pass on uh, for that to happen. People ask, what can you do? You, you probably heard me say this. What can you do about Justice Thomas, Justice Alito? I would suggest send him a subscription to Omaha Steaks, the extra marbly kind. <laughs> Just send it to him, and that's as bad as good. It will change, and we'll get a better court. So, again, the title. Did he even read the 14th Amendment? So, there we go. Good. Are there any thoughts or questions? All right, so we're going to move to a Q&A section. Just a quick reminder on Q&A rules. Uh, please ask one question uh, without follow-ups um, so that everybody here can get a chance to speak. If you have not already, I hear a lot of phones going off in the audience. Please turn your phones off so we can all uh, give Mr. McWhorter our full attention. And with that, I see Roger's got his hand up already. Wow, that was a really fascinating presentation. Good. And I'm wondering, I, I assume you'll be back for the uh, 15th through 27th amendments. <laughs> <laughs> well, well I, can, I can give you uh, three other talks. I haven't written that far yet. I mean, it takes me a while to get there. Okay, then in that case, <laughs> I'd rather not wait for the conclusion. I'm wondering, what can we do now uh, what efforts can we support to reform the court? Ah. I've heard things like change the numbers, uh, term limits. What, uh, what would be most effective? Okay. First of all, if you want to really fundamentally change the court, you got to have a constitutional amendment. Most of it, you, you can't have term limits. The Constitution says life. Now, there is an, I generally think that's a good thing. There is an argument that when they originally wrote that, life didn't mean as long as these guys hang around. <laughs> So you got a justice who's appointed for life. He might be on there five, six, eight years, but then you know he, he, he moves on to his reward and you appoint somebody else, right? Now justices stay on for decades and decades. Um, what I'm going to say is uh, I generally don't warm up to ideas of structural reform of the court. I think nine has kind of been accepted, kind of works well, despite Lincoln's little court packing thing. I think you just have to get better justices on there. There is only one way, and I apologize to any Republicans in the room, but there's only one way to do this now, and that is vote Democrat. Okay, I, and I don't mean it's just the, the Republican Party has committed itself to justices with these values. They, the Republican Party didn't used to do that. Um, Justice O'Connor, for instance, was a great supporter of Roe versus Wade. So the current Republican Party's picks are not fulfilling a new birth of freedom. Now, either change the Republican Party or vote Democrat. That's the, the, I'm just looking at the political realities of the way justices are selected. And my apologies to you know a Republicans here. I don't mean, but but even you probably have to see the problem uh, in this situation. This has been a created court that has been 
whittled and, and created to do exactly what they are doing, and they've been working at this for at least 40 years, all through the federal judiciary as well. So, yeah. By the way, don't forget Earl Warren was a Republican appointee. Uh, following up on that. As was Justice um, Brennan, yeah. by the way. You're you're, yeah. you're familiar with Justice Powell in 72 and yeah. Nixon appointed him in the Powell memo. Yeah. I, first time I read that, I was just awestruck. Because uh -huh. um, it basically lays out the format for getting all of these judges appointed under the Republicans. Um, your thoughts, what I, I have always credited that to the Vietnam War and the protest. But the Legal Defense Fund really was, seems to be the first real implementation of a long-term plan to yeah. overturn Supreme Court justices and to change the Supreme Court. And now that I've heard your presentation, it looks like Powell just wrote that memo mimicking what uh, the LDF did Interesting. previously. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you, the LDF, um, all, almost all modern groups, now usually they're the, the right-wing groups now, follow the, the, the playbook that the LDF created, or, or at least refined. Um, Legal Defense Fund, uh, part of the NAACP's, uh, it's connected with the NAACP but independent of it, um, and, uh, and under the auspices of the NAACP. But they created the game plan that all these other groups are still using. So they created the game plan and the Republicans co-opted Yeah, but the biggest thing the Republicans did was through the Federalist Society, yeah. co-opted the selection process. Donald Trump got all their support, and look, I'm just speaking about facts, political reality, by listing who from the, Donald Trump doesn't care about the court, he doesn't care about anything, but he picked, he said, I'll pick people from this list of people from the uh, Federal Society. Now, the Federal Society's opinions, and this is my opinion, I find their legal opinions to be cogent, logical, and wrong. <laughs> Uh, they, they have a certain hold together, and they, 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 but they're, they're wrong for a whole series. A lot of times they're wrong in their premise and their whatever. And they, for the most part, are fringe ideas that, you're, that are getting hearings. This idea recently about the state legislatures as the super legislator on elections was an utter fringe idea. Now, it got shot down, thankfully, but the fact that it even got a hearing is shocking. Um, and so this colorblind constitution taking Justice uh, John Marshall Harlan the first's language and now applying it as a basis to get rid of affirmative action it used to be a very fringe idea. Now it holds sway. Um, and this current majority is doing as much as they possibly can in the short time because they have arrogated to themselves. They have this power and they're going to use it, which is why you get what was essentially, I believe, a advisory opinion in the web uh, designer case. We're not even a case in controversy, but they're going to go in and do it, and next term is going to be more of the same. No, none. This person wanted to create a website for weddings, web page for weddings business, and didn't want to serve same sex people. So, yeah, nobody came in. Right. Nobody in harm. Right. No case or controversy is the legal language. No case or controversy. Hey, Bob, that was terrific. Thank you for oh, sure. putting together such a great presentation. I want to ask one of Marie's favorite questions, which is why haven't we seen any amendments for the past 50 years? Oh, We had quite a few in the 70s. Isn't it time for some amendments to make the intent of the Constitution yeah, even more clear? You know, it, it's actually, by design, it's hard to amend the Constitution. And arguably, the Supreme Court, every October term, you have a little amendment process of the Constitution going on anyway, uh, but it's hard to do. Look, there's things I'd like to see amended in the Constitution. The trouble is once people start talking about amending the Constitution, it gets me nervous because like, oh, I don't like this little part about the Sixth Amendment that says, you know, criminals go free if the police, you know, I, I get worried. I mean, you know, I kind of like some changes to the Second Amendment. I kind of like to get rid of the Electoral College, a few things, you know, but, and you can do it in other ways, but when you start talking about amending, then people do it. There are actually three ways to amend the Constitution, um, but uh, two get talked about. Um, the usual way is you just have a 
you know, three-fourths of the states goes out of the House of Congress and then amend it that way. The other is to have constitutional conventions. That's how the 21st Amendment. There's another way that Congress can call for a constitutional convention. That's never been used. So, so yeah. So it's just kind of hard to do and to coalesce around an idea is the difficulty uh, of it. So, yeah, everybody coalesced around the idea of getting rid of prohibition. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Ah. Now that's interesting because the Constitution, that goes, see we live, we, d we actually don't live in a democracy. We live in a democratic republic as was intended. Once you start talking about initiatives and referendum like we have in Arizona, that is part of the progressive movement in constitutional history and that would change the nature of the Constitution uh, greatly. So, yeah, uh, there's talk, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, my, my question is, well, it, it's around partisanship, uh -huh. and it's obviously been going on for many, many, many years. I'm not partisan at all. Oh, I, I, I'm, talking, <laughs> I'm talking about the courts. It seems like yeah. you have to be on one side or the other. I know. And you have to represent that once you get to the court, which sort of goes against what a judge should be doing. So is there any place in the world where we have nonpartisan judges? Have we ever tried yeah. to have somebody and, and say, look, your views are <laughs> definitely you're the support of one party or another. Is there any way to get rid of that? Well, most judges that I have appeared in front of are nonpartisan in their rulings and their applications, um, especially yeah, the in lower levels. the lower, lower levels. And you know, I have I have appeared in front of judges who were appointed by right wing presidents. They have a right wing background, but they're great. That they understand their role, et cetera, and it's been uh, consistent. Um, the judges, for instance, that uh, John Kyle was involved with appointing to the bench were superb, just superb. And I don't agree politically with any of them. So yes, by and large, the system actually works quite well. I will attest to that. The Supreme Court, what they've done, are these people partisan or were they carefully selected because of their partisan views and philosophies? I think it's more the latter and you can't get these people off it, no matter what reasoning. So they have these defined situations. Are they being partisan? They would say, no, this is just my judicial philosophy. But that's why they were selected. So, and frankly, the Democrats were asleep at the switch, and this is what's happened, and that hopefully has changed. Yeah. Yeah. I, I propose an amendment to the Senate hearing system that, uh, that nobody should be allowed <coughs> allowed to claim that they defend stare decisis and then change their minds once they're on the court. <laughs> <sighs> That's supposed to be the rule. John Roberts would agree with you. John Roberts and Lena Kagan are, are institutionalists and would go with you on that. Um, the other one's not. This uh, current majority, uh, centered more around Alito than even Thomas, uh, has no respect for precedent or stare decisis. If it, if it doesn't the support way. their view, if it's in the way, good point, yeah, good way to put it, if it's in the way. Um, and they're very, actually quite clear about it. Thomas, Alito are very clear. They will not let precedent. Now when Thomas is talking about the civil rights cases and the cases I've talked about, I don't really disagree with him on that. Time has shown they should be gotten rid of and overturned. Uh, but he's willing to do it on just about everything, including Roe versus Wade, affirmative action, all kinds of things. These are very activist court, so activist judges. Yeah, I think the activism point is really brought home by that latest cake case. But I, I want to kind of take a little bit of issue with uh, focusing so much on the legal history of uh, discrimination and anti-discrimination because I don't think it really creates the uh, the foundation for an argument for affirmative action when you think. Historically, the problem was so serious about having the law not allow equality, mm -hmm. whereas I think the argument for affirmative, affirmative action comes more out of social discrimination that is not under law, but can law do something about it? So I just wonder what you think yeah. about that, Bob. Oh, I think you're right. And I think, um, again, I'll go back to what I said about a differential standard of view. The court should be deferential to Congress's and legislative decisions on that that are seeking to create racial equality. 
um, rather than overturning them. The court, I don't think, should even be involved in the affirmative action case at all. Shouldn't be subject for their review based on what the Constitution says under Section 5 of the 14th Amendment, Section 2 of the 13th, and Section 2 of the 15th. So, so yeah, I, I mean, now when you have laws that are creating racial discrimination against a huge part of America, you know, persons of color, well, that's a different question. Because that was the purpose of the amendments. So, and again, Justice uh, Kenja Brown Jackson is very clear on this, and she understands that. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Um, my apologies if this is too broad of a question, but when there is you no flawed question. <laughs> <laughs> um, but when you when you were bringing up what um, was brought up in the gentleman going to Harvard case about how this was impeding him, it made me think about how it took so long for um, disabled individuals to also gain a fair amount of civil rights, mm -hmm. and I'm wondering. What uh, I'm wondering what your opinion is on why it, the 13th, 14th, 15th amendments, why that had didn't apply up until the very late 60s and even still today. Probably didn't think of it. <laughs> no, I mean, uh, sometimes there's in, in statutes and things, there's not a grander design. They, they just didn't think of it. Uh, by the way, the big arguments um, for the 14th and 15th amendments was why didn't it include women? And in fact, the great supporters of the 13th Amendment, Susan B. Anthony and, and Elizabeth Stanton, opposed the 15th Amendment because it gave black people the right to vote over white people, or white women, or women, but specifically white women. So there was a lot of other things going on. They both got kind of chided by Frederick Douglass pretty handily. But, um, but yeah, sometimes they just didn't think about it. So. Got time for a couple more questions sure. here. Um, so you had a hand up? Uh -huh. Okay, so this is a philosophy question. I'm new, <laughs> mm -hmm. and i hearing arguments all over the map. You said a thing about there's not really states' rights, and I'm just wondering, in our, in our current ability to communicate and be effective, when we're talking about it needs to be a federal thing that's solved at a federal issue, we're waiting for judges to die, isn't there kind of a space to say, you know what, what if we did have states' rights, and then we would have a lot more power to be able to say, this is what's logical, this is what's right, if, it, if we actually knew the people that were okay. the decision makers. Well, first of all, that's the constitutional structure we actually have. We live in a federalist system, which has, uh, and, and the Constitution is one of enumerated powers. So the power isn't enumerated in the Constitution, then it's reserved to the states for that, for that regulation or that subject, right? That's the foundation, okay? Um, what states' rights is actually in practice has been a way of enforcing racial segregation, slavery, and, um, and, a, and a pushback on desegregation and civil rights. So when people talk about states' rights, that's what happened. Now when I say there was not a such thing as states' rights in this context, um, and this is all I talk about in my first kind of lecture on this topic, right? Well, that's state jurisdiction. Yeah, there's federalism, there's state jurisdiction on certain things. Okay, like for instance, you know, you you commit a homicide. Okay, if you didn't like what I said and you killed me, it wouldn't be a federal case, unless we were on an Indian reservation. But we're not. Okay, so it wouldn't be a federal case. It's state. So there is in that sense. But when you hear the term states' rights, it means a resistance to racial equality, and it always has. It's been the stalking horse. Okay. So you're not actually talking about states' rights, you're talking about state sovereignty in certain areas, which does exist, and that was the argument for it. They're closer to the people. That's the way most regulation happens. Now, when we're really talking about states' rights as that, as the stalking horse, the South never wanted states' rights because northern states were passing laws against the Fugitive Slave Act, which required northern states to send people back who had escaped to bondage they hated states' rights before the Civil War. They created this entire thing after the Civil War as a justification. We weren't fighting to protect slavery, we were fighting for states' rights. Total fabric and part of the lost cause myth. So that's the context of what I'm, so. And I can expand on that greatly in a whole nother talk if you wish. There's one here and one back there. Yeah, yeah Bob. Um, oh, hey Susan. <clears throat> Hi. It just sparked something in my memory when you showed that um, impeach 
Earl Warren poster that yeah. was up there. Um, back when I was a, a very young, very young child, not that young, but young enough to know better, um, we were driving through the South to Florida and billboards everywhere, as soon as you crossed into the so-called South, saying impeach Earl Warren, giant billboards with yeah. big American flags, um, at least not the stars and bars, but close enough. The other thing, I just wanted to tell you a little anecdote was, um, so I went with my cousins to go shopping and they had two water fountains as you showed in the mm -hmm. slide. One, one white and one colored. And I immediately went over to the colored one to turn it on because I wanted to see the colored water. <laughs> 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 Big disappointment. <laughs> okay. That's funny. There's a question right here. Pat? Where are we? Okay. <clears throat> and then one back there. It's more of a comment. I just wanted to thank Bob for mailing my son uh, his latest book to an Arizona prison. And I thought your audience would be interested to know that <laughs> it was banned because of the sexual content. Yeah. There was a picture here of a statue in my book that you'll see on page 200, 201, those of you who have it, which is a statue out in front of uh, the White House, Lafayette Square. And it's a neoclassical kind of nude. And so my book was banned by the Department of Corrections because of nudity. <laughs> so. so I'm proud to say that my book is banned. Uh, there's a question back over there. So, so I do still see a lot of hands uh, going up and waving. However we, however, we are running a little bit over on time. So Bob, I want to yeah, ask okay. you this. For all these folks that want yeah. more information on what you've been speaking about today, and all these folks who are going to ask you to come back and speak to us sure. again, how can they get in touch with you? Where can we find you online? Where can we get more information on what you have to say? Uh, well, OK. First of all, I will be teaching at Barrett's a series of five public lectures in the fall. Uh, you'll, you've already heard two of them <laughs> so, so in that. So you can always do that uh, and follow that with the Barrett thing, and I'll do that. Uh, I will also give notice to the humanists, and then you can emanate it from there as far as that. And then, of course, I'm always happy to come back. Um, there is one talk that, one more question. Let's give them one more, one more. Uh, but yeah, so you can do that. I've got to set up a better web page. I'm not a very good marketer myself. And if you have certain skills in that way, please you know, talk to me, but I don't do that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You know what, I, I, I don't happen to be gay, but I will tell her I'm gay just for that purpose. Yeah. Bob, thanks yeah. again, great talk. Sure. Um, after Roe was overturned by Dobbs, mm -hmm. Lisa Murkowski and Susan Collins and I think, I think a couple of other senators said that they felt totally betrayed because when they were having discussions with I think Amy, uh, Amy Tony Barrett. Barrett and with Brett Kavanaugh and one or two others, that they were given literally complete assurance that they would not disturb Roe and that they felt totally betrayed. In those circumstances, is there a way to get rid of those justices that outright no. lied to the Senate? No, there's not. We don't get rid of justices for the rulings on the bench. It's not a ground for impeachment. That was established in the Samuel Chase impeachment case of 1803. And that's a good thing. That's a good principle. As far as their statements, you can, were they naive or just, just disingenuous? I think they're disingenuous. Are you kidding me? Everybody knew they were put on to overturn Roe versus Wade. Don't give me this, oh, gnashing of teeth, like, oh, gee, I was lied to. Well, shut up. You should have taken a stand at the time. That's your job as a senator. So I don't give any credence to their statement in the least. So. Yeah. And by the way, look at Coney Barrett's background. Of course she was going to overturn Roe versus Wade. What was the joke? I mean, come on. Brett Kavanaugh, you know, if he stopped drinking beer, was going to do it. You knew it. So, fine. I hope that last part wasn't taped. Okay. <laughs> awesome. Go Thank on. you. Thank you. And as we, uh, as we close out here today, uh, I encourage all of you guys